All right, welcome again. This is Jessica from Next Gen Personal Finance. Thanks for joining me for the webinar. Um, we will go ahead and get started now. The topic today is brush up on financial pitfalls, and that is what we're going to do. Um, so I want to get this uh, sort of situated right from the start. How is this different from a VPD? Many of you have probably been engaging in virtual professional developments with other members of our team, maybe Tim or Sonia or Abby or Kareem or maybe some of our fellows. Um, the webinar is sort of our more traditional format that we've been doing for many years now while the VPDs are kind of new. And um, so I will tell you that this is going to be way less interactive than the VPDs are. Um, so you can go ahead and shut off your camera. You can shut off your microphone because I'm not going to call on you. You're not going to get put into breakout rooms. This is going to be sort of more, uh, if, to put it in, in classroom terms, this is going to be sort of more like a lecture, um, which if that is not what you want, I will not take personal offense if you're like, I'm out of here, Jessica. Um, but this is going to be sort of more me giving you some information about um, financial pitfalls, that unit in our curriculum and less about your collaborating. So again, you can shut off your mic, shut off your camera if you want, um, and we will go ahead and get started. The other thing I will mention is that unlike a VPD where we're sort of like, hey, jump in at any time if you have questions, put them in the chat box, you know, unmute yourself and go ahead and ask, I'm gonna ask that you don't unmute yourself on this one. Um, again, sort of so I can kind of keep my flow and keep going. I will check in with the, um, chat bar occasionally, but not all the time. So if you've asked a question and it's taking me a while to get there, um, I that is why. Um, but speaking of, I'm gonna check in on that uh, right now. Let me see, oops, let me see if I can find it. Nope, not what I wanted. Hold on folks, let me, yep, okay, sorry. I'm getting re, re acclimated here. Let me make sure I know where to find the chat. Great, okay, so we're good. Okay. Um, Taking off then, I'm Jessica. I'm one of the co-founders of NextGen Personal Finance. This is kind of an old picture of me, but um, it's what I had. Um, prior to joining the team here at NextGen, I was the principal of a high school in Brooklyn, New York. And way back in the day, I was a math teacher as well. So I actually never got to teach personal finance, uh, but I wish I had because um, I think in terms of applying it to your everyday life, there's not a class, there are very few classes at the high school level that meet that demand so very um, discreetly of, of being able to be used every single day. So happy to be working in the personal finance education realm now. Um, I will also tell you that uh, this is only my second week back from a, I don't know, two, two and a half month maternity leave. So if I'm a little bit rusty, you gotta, get, you gotta cut me some slack. Um, somehow all three of my small children also woke me up at a different point of the night last night. So, you know, today's not my A game, but I'm gonna do the best I can. Um, I thought perfectly fitting was if you're a subscriber to our blog digest today and a great kickoff to this webinar on financial pitfalls is the idea of the question of the day put out by Tim, how much more time do adults spend watching TV versus managing household finances in a typical month? How much more time do they spend watching TV than they do dealing with their finances? And this is not teenagers. <coughs> Here we go. It turns out that it is 70 times more time watching TV. Uh, adults tend on average to spend 85 hours a month on TV compared to one hour and 12 minute on their finances. Um, so if you're familiar with our questions of the day, first slide is always a question. Second slide is always the answer with a little um, piece here at the bottom where you can click for more info. And then third is follow-up questions that you can use in your classroom for discussion. We're not gonna have discussion today because as I mentioned, this is sort of more of a, a lecture style PD that you're engaged in right now, but um, you could ask these questions of your students if you gave this question of the day in the classroom. Uh, here's what we're going to do today. We are going to go over, I'm going to provide an overview of our financial pitfalls unit. It, and I'm going to tell you a little bit of why I love this unit in particular. And then we are going to do a little bit of learning and a little bit of sharing resources for each of the topics that are in our financial pitfalls unit. 
And then at the end, I'm going to show you where you can find even more resources. Um, so without further ado, this is how our unit on financial pitfalls is structured. Um, it is split between uh, these six topics that you see here on the screen. And um, basically, it's a little more disjointed than some of our other units because it's not as though one builds on top of the other. It's not as though like you need to do ID theft first so that students understand predatory lending. Those are two fairly discrete topics, um, but they all kind of lump into a unit of financial pitfalls. And honestly, <coughs> one of my favorite units in our whole curriculum, the reason that First of all, everybody makes mistakes, and so a lot of these fall into the possibility of an area where you could make a financial mistake. Um, the second is that each of these lessons involves so much other content that you would have covered in other units. So for example, when we are talking about predatory lending, um, your students are going to have to pull in a lot of information about, um, you know, interest rates the same way that they would have learned in the types of credit and loans and um, debt as well. So there's some sort of like refreshers on other units you may have already done in your class. When they talk about ID theft, a lot of that is checking your credit report. So then that ties into the managing credit unit that's in a more standard curriculum as well. Um, as you'll see later, a lot of the resources having that are paired up with our lottery lesson can sort of go back to saving money as well as planning out your budget as well as investing. So there's lots of overlap and that's one of the reasons I love this unit so much. I feel like it's particularly great to either intersperse the lessons as sort of review throughout your term um, for other units you may have already covered or it's, it could potentially be a great unit to put at the end of your curriculum so that again your students can pull back in their minds of like oh man we learned about different types of loans we here's some alternatives you could use instead of a payday loan etc so lots of good stuff in this unit i'm going to take a really quick second um oh okay so i've got somebody saying they're still struggling to get volume um but nobody else has mentioned that so i think that that's potentially a problem on just your setting, not everybody else's, because it seems like nobody else is complaining that they can't hear me. Um, the best thing I can say is on Zoom, there's a, like a little microphone button. And if you push the little up carrot next to it, you've got some settings about uh, your own system and you can try that. Okay, they've got it, they've got it straightened. And then another request to everybody to make sure you mute yourselves as well. I don't hear anybody else, but um, terrific. Okay. I'm gonna sort of zoom back to my presentation here. All right, so the first thing I want to do here is, um, oh man, and again, I'm kind of new to this uh, software. Let me make sure I know how to do it. Um, I want to launch a poll of how many of you have been to FinCamp. So go ahead and, um, Oh man, okay, I've never done this before. I wanted you to only be able to see one poll. Not sure if you're seeing all my polls or just one of them. Let's see. Hmm, is anybody able to see my poll? I launched it and you should be able to vote of whether you've been at a fin camp before. says attendees are now viewing my questions, but nobody is answering my questions. Okay, we've got one person. Look around to see if you see a poll somewhere on your screen. I also unfortunately set this up incorrectly and you can see all of my polls. So again, I'm kind of new to this, but go ahead and take all of the polls <laughs> and we'll see, we'll see how this works out. Sorry, I'm a bit rusty, folks. Seems like about four or five of you have taken it so far. If you see it on your screen, go ahead and take all my poll questions for me. I'll give you another minute to answer.
All right, it seems about 65% of you have your answers in. If the other folks are seeing the poll, go ahead and submit it now. I'll give you about 30 more seconds and then we'll move on from this. All right, last chance to get your votes in. It seems like everybody who wanted to vote has probably already done so, but five more seconds to go ahead and submit. All right, um, here we go. Um, so what I wanted to know was kind of how many of you have been to a fin camp since the start of this school year. And the reason I ask is because this relatively new activity of um, is it a pitfall is a move activity and uh, we've been doing it at fin camp. So about half of you have already seen it, but generally speaking, what it is is it's a series of slides um, for those who don't know. And they each have a statement on it, such as this one. Most Americans are savvy enough to avoid internet and email scams. And it's sort of a four corners move around the room activity where one corner will say strongly agree, another agree. Um, the third corner will say disagree and the fourth one will say strongly disagree. And the idea is, you know, you'll put up the slide and your students will move to which of those four corners uh, best matches their sort of opinion on this. So the idea that most Americans are savvy enough to avoid internet and email scams. Um, I had you guys go ahead and vote there and uh, I'm not sure if you can see them, but uh, 14 of you disagreed <laughs> and said that, uh, that you don't agree that most people are savvy enough and five of you said you do agree with that. Um, it's kind of, if you haven't seen it at a fin camp, it's a fun activity to get students up out of their seats. And then the idea would be you'd have your students discuss with one another. Um, and you can kind of have, find a, have them find somebody that thinks similar to, to them, somebody who speaks differently. You could have people answer in front of the entire class or sort of pair share, whatever you want to do. But it's a good way to sort of take some of these topics from the financial pitfalls unit and get students discussing, thinking critically about them first sort of generalizing how they feel about that specific topic and then getting them to discuss as well. All right, so the first topic we're gonna to talk about is um, scams and fraud. And I thought this was an interesting graph here, <laughs> which sort of shows a, sort of an inverse proportionality. Um, along the bottom there, you see age ranges and the highest percentage a uh, group that has said, has reported like a fraud um, is people 19 and under. So more uh, kids under the age of 19, so the students most of you are teaching have experienced fraud than say older age groups. However, the amount of money in that young age group that they um, report having lost as part of the fraud is relatively low compared to that super, super, super um, high bar at the end, which is people 80 and older. So there you've got this example of uh, not very many people are taking advantage of older people, but when they are, they're scamming them out of a lot of money. Whereas the opposite is true for very young people. <laughs> Tons of people are scamming your teenage students, um, but they're not getting all that much money. Um, though $188 to a very young person is actually probably a substantial amount of the money that they perhaps have. Um, and when you, after the webinar is over, I will send out either this evening or tomorrow the slide deck to you and all of these links will be clickable. So the, the FTC put out, um, puts out an annual sort of report with tons and tons of statistics like this one that you could use in your classroom or to sort of introduce topics to your students. Um, I also thought really interesting was this FinCap Friday. So most of you are probably familiar with um, my coworker Yanelli's FinCap Fridays that come out every single Friday. If you subscribe to the NGPF blog, you'll get them in your inbox. Um, for those who might be in the dark somehow about this, uh, basically, each FinCap Friday is centered on a current event. It is a five-question Kahoot. Um, 
Or if you don't want to distribute technology to all of your students or you want to do it in kind of low tech way, there's also slides that have the five questions on them that you can use the no tech version as well. And then once your students play that Kahoot, then there is what we call an explainer video from Yanelli. So what I'm going to do now, because um, this is a really good one called Who's Calling, we're not going to do the entire Freedom Cat Friday with the Kahoot and everything, but um, in case you haven't seen it, I'm going to go ahead and play this video because Yanelli does a really great job explaining uh, phone scams. Whoops. Nelly Espinal with another FinCap Friday brought to you by NextGen Personal Finance. Have you ever gotten a call from a blocked or unknown number? If you have your own cell phone, then I'm sure the answer is yes, because a new telecommunications report shows that half of all calls made to cell phones in 2019 will be scam calls. In fact, the number of unwanted phone calls that happen every single month is estimated to be around 4 billion. Most of these are automated recordings, but a lot of them are actually real people trying to get money from you or personal information over the phone. And the worst part about this is that it works Works. We get scammed out of nine and a half billion dollars every year. But if Google knows how to block spam emails, then why can't these phone companies block scam phone calls? Well, scam callers are getting smarter and harder to track. For example, now they're doing this thing called neighborhood spoofing, where they call you from a number that has the same area code as yours. Because if you're recognizing it even just a little, you're more likely to pick up the phone. On top of that, phone companies don't want to block any calls to people's phones because if they mistakenly block an important call that they thought was a scam, they can be in really big trouble. And that's a liability they don't want to deal with. So next time you see a sketchy number calling your phone, here's what to do. If you don't recognize the number, just let it go to voicemail. Trust, scammers will not be leaving you voicemail messages. But if you do end up on a suspicious phone call, don't share any personal information. Ask where are you calling from and why do you need this information? Don't be afraid to hang up the phone, especially if they claim to be the IRS, Social Security, or the DMV, or another similar agency. The government is not gonna call your phone. They're gonna contact you via mail, unless you call them first. All right, so um, I thought you know, Ellie did a really great job of explaining sort of phone scams. Of course, there are tons of different kinds of scams. And so what I've done here is I've provided some of the um, more interesting or applicable resources. Um, some of them are from our lessons, while others are things that I found myself independently or that the team has indicated are really great resources. Um, and I separated it into two separate columns here in the learning column. And again, you'll get access to these slides and you'll be able to click all these um, links. This, this one is a really funny one to share with your students. Essentially, somebody who's super familiar with how the IRS works got on one of these calls with an IRS scammer. Um, and uh, it's sort of a tw funny Twitter thread, which may or may not like interest your students um, about how she handled this fake IRS call that she received. Um, and then I also thought that our full year course in 8.2, um, lesson 8.2 on scams and fraud, had a good article about the difference between multi-level marketing and Ponzi schemes or pyramid schemes. Um, and I think that's a really interesting topic because as more and more sort of sales are happening through social media, um, it's good to be able for, and important for your students to be able to recognize like what is a very legitimate multi-level marketing style business or direct sale business and which are posing as that sort of opportunity but are actually a scam. So I thought that was a good um, resource to include here. And then you'll see we also have two additional FinCap Fridays around the topic of scams. We've got a really cool project about creating a scam guidebook where your students sort of jigsaw information on all different kinds of scams and put together um, like a, a digital guidebook on dealing with scams and then a good data crunch around this as well. I'm gonna really quickly check my chats to make sure that uh, I'm not missing anything essential from any of you. Okay, I think we are good. All right, let me go back here. Um, 
All right. Uh, the next one is, as a teenager, I don't really need to worry about identity theft. All of you either said strongly disagree or disagree. And, um, you know, your teen students might not know that they should be disagreeing with this statement because they might be thinking like, uh, why would anybody steal my identity? I don't really have that much information or I don't really have a credit card so they can't use my credit. Um, but the whole thing is that many sort of scammers do intentionally try to steal children's identities um, because precisely for the fact that you know kids aren't applying for credit cards or aren't applying for car loans so it can be years and years and years before people realize like wow somebody has been using my identity since i was four years old um, and racking up debt and you know taking out all kinds of loans that they're not paying back so on and so forth um, so definitely teenagers should be concerned about identity theft um, Again, the FTC, this really great survey, um, they uh, have it reported out by state about identity theft reports. Um, and essentially, like if I go ahead and I'll, I'll zoom over here and click for you so you can see how you might use this in your classroom. Um, this is the most recent one. It came out in February 2019 and it has all the data from 2018. And if I kind of, oops, that's not what I wanted to do. If I sort of zoom to 20, here's um, state rankings about fraud and other reports. You can see that uh, Florida has the most per 100,000 residents um, and down here, North Dakota has the least. Um, and then you can also see specifically about identity theft. In this case, Georgia has the most reported cases of identity theft. Uh, with Vermont being the least. And then you get this cool one pager about each state um, where you can kind of see the top 10 categories of scams and frauds that are happening in your state, as well as where you rank compared to other places, how your major metropolitan areas, um, how sort of the incidences of fraud and ID theft vary there, um, and then how people are stealing IDs specifically in your state. So I think this is a really cool resource that you can use with your students to kind of, if you live in a major metro area, drill down to that level, but otherwise just kind of see how it compares to your state um, and to other states around it. And I prepared sort of these questions that you could use if you decided to give your students that sort of one pager about your specific state. Um, also kind of sharing these resources. These are some of the best ones I thought we have around ID theft. Um, this interactive, have you been hacked? Um, I will point this out. It's from the New York Times. And I actually feel like uh, this one is okay for students, um, but probably might be of even more interest to you as an adult um, about how many times your personal information, whoops, Oh no, sorry. Um, I actually do have a subscription, but I'm not logged in right now. Sorry about that. Anyway, it's kind of really cool. And you can uh, answer the questions about like, which cards do you have? Which stores do you shop at, et cetera? And it will give you um, a, a sort of rating of how likely it is that your information has been stolen in one of these big, huge data breaches that you hear about. Um, we have a worksheet that goes along with it if you want to use it with your students. But like I said, it's also generally kind of interesting to you probably as an adult if you've never taken it yourself. All right, so um, this is one of my favorite topics. So it's never a good idea to take out a payday loan. Um, in the financial pitfalls unit, the one about predatory lending is one of my absolute favorites. I think from my work here at MGPF talking with teachers. It's one that some of you have like a really good understanding of, perhaps um, because you yourself have experience with payday loans or because it's really prevalent in the community in which you teach and thus you've like sort of educated yourself about it. But then I've also equally run into as many teachers that are like, I have no idea how a payday loan works. I've never done one. My students have never brought it up, but it's kind of a good, interesting topic to know something about. Um, so a little statistic for you from um, Pew, who did a, a study about this, um, only one in 10 Americans view payday lenders positively. Um, and you can see comparing to banks, credit unions um, get the most favorable uh, ratings among Americans. 
Um, most people, a majority, 62%, have positive feelings about credit unions, but only 9% have positive um, views of payday lenders. And one of, I think, the most interesting things is, um, if you don't already know, essentially, in a nutshell, payday lenders allow you to get really small dollar loans. Um, I think the average is like 150 or 250 dollars is the average payday loan. Um, you don't, they don't do a credit check. You don't really, um, you, you typically go in person to like a storefront is how most people do it. Um, and they basically will give you a loan for an upfront fee. So maybe it's like a hundred dollar loan and the fee is $15, but you have to pay back that $100 usually in a two week time frame, and you have to pay it all back in one lump sum. So basically at the end of the two weeks, if you only have 75 of the dollars, they won't take $75 and say, okay, now the next time you owe us 25, you're only, you have to pay back the full hundred at one time, or most of them will let you uh, renew the loan for another $15. So you can kind of see what happens is if folks are kind of strapped for cash and they have to take out a hundred dollar loan, it may or may not be likely that in two weeks they are going to have the hundred dollars to pay it back in one lump sum. So instead at that point, they pay $15 to renew the loan for another two weeks and it can just keep going and going and going. And one of the common misconceptions about payday loans is that people only take them out when they have some huge emergency um, that like kind of leaves them with no other option. But in reality, uh, the first time people take out a payday loan, 69% of those people say that they're doing it for a recurring expense. So you can see something like a utility bill, a car payment, a credit card payment. So basically they're taking out a payday loan to make their credit card payment. Um, another 10% on their rent or mortgage and 5% on food. And then again, that misconception is that all of these are sort of emergencies that people didn't plan for, but in reality, that only makes up like 16% of people's first time using a payday loan. Um, so really what people, are, most people, 70% are using them for is to meet sort of the expenses they can anticipate having and that are a part of their daily life, but that they don't have the money to cover right then. Um, I want to also play this video for you because um, this kind of gets behind some of the logic about why payday lenders are so prevalent and why so many people, if they could help it, or why so many people continue to take out payday loans, even though the, the effective interest rate of paying that $15 or whatever it might be to renew your loan ends up having them way overpay the original amount of the loan. So this PBS NewsHour video, which I'm gonna show you now, does a way better job of explaining it than I could. Next, you need some cash? I'm gonna sort of zoom ahead because it starts out actually um, talking about check cashing, but we're gonna zoom ahead to the part on payday loans. So they bring me everything here. <laughs> Okay, maybe there are good reasons to use check cashers, but surely not payday lenders, so common in cash-strapped communities these days. Servon writes that there are more payday lenders in the U.S. than Starbucks and McDonald's combined, and she herself did a stint at one. Where I worked in California, they cost $15 per $100 borrowed, which comes out to an APR of 400 or 600 percent. That's APR annual percentage rate because it's 15 yes. percent, $15, 15 right. on 100. A lot of people end up not being able to pay the loan when it's due, and this is where the problem comes in, right? If you can't pay that $100 loan back in two weeks, you basically end up taking out that loan again and paying another $15 for another two weeks. So now you're paying $30 on $100, right? And if you you roll it over five or six times, you're paying way more than you borrowed. But look, says Joe Coleman, there's nowhere to go to get a couple hundred dollars. The payday industry has evolved organically to solve a short term immediate problem. And I don't do the product, by the way, in New York, we don't we don't do payday lending in New York. But you would. Yes, I would if, if I could. Right? Because it's a reasonable product if you use it responsibly in the way it's designed. Not surprisingly, Suzanne Martindale of Consumers Union disagrees. 
The evidence has been clear and damning for many, many years that the vast majority of people that start to take out payday loans end up in a cycle of debt. 80% of payday loans are reborrowed within 14 days, and almost 90% are reborrowed within 60 days. In fact, Servon says. What's interesting is that even my boss at the payday lender said payday is a lousy product, but we're filling a need that nobody else will fill. But aren't the payday lenders taking advantage of these people? It's a very hard question to answer. The question really being, are payday loans helpful or harmful? Or alternatively, is very expensive credit better than no credit at all? And I would say that the jury is still out on that question. We talk about getting rid of the lenders without recognizing that the demand is still there. And the demand is still there because we've had declining wages since the 70s. Income volatility has doubled over the past 30 years, so people have much less ability to predict how much money is coming into their household from week to week. And the less predictable the income, says Joe Coleman, the greater the need for check cashing or payday lending even. Voltaire said of the supreme being that if he didn't exist, we'd have to invent him. And the same can be said for our industry. If we didn't exist, you'd have to invent us. People need the service. The PBS News Hour. This is economics correspondent Paul Solomon reporting from. So the questions I have over here on this side of the slide are the questions that would appear in the student activity packet um, that goes along with the video. Um, so the idea sort of being that um, if you're not super familiar with how our lessons are structured, you would show the video in class or your students would self pace and watch the video and then these would be sort of the comprehension or reflection questions that you could ask them to go along with the video. Um, there, like I said, this is one of my favorite topics, so I'm going to spend a little bit more time on it. Um, there's some interesting work going on right now around payday lending and how maybe it can be restructured because as the video you just saw notes, um, you don't need to get a credit, a background, or sorry, a credit check. You don't need a credit score to qualify for a payday loan. You need to be employed and show proof that you're going to receive another paycheck, essentially. Um, and so for folks who can't get a credit card or their credit cards are maxed out or for um, a really small amount, like banks are not really interested in, in, most banks are not interested in loaning you $200, right? Most bank loans are for more money than that and they take a while to get, they can't be gotten like right on the spot. So essentially that's what the video was saying about it, it's filling a need that people have and that there's a demand for that no other product is really filling right now. So right now, um, in the last month or so, there's been five members of Congress um, of both Republican and Democratic uh, persuasions that are looking to expand the Military Lending Act, which basically put a ceiling on how much interest can be charged to people in the active military. However, right now, it doesn't apply to veterans and it doesn't apply to this, the general American public. So there are five um, Congress people that are kind of trying to push through or bring up a bill that would expand that so that all Americans are covered and have like a cap on what the effective APR that payday lenders would be allowed to charge. The second sort of thing that's going on in this realm is FDIC, the Federal Reserve Board and the OCC are kind of collaborating right now to think about how else could you expand access to lower cost small dollar loans. And right now banks generally are not offering them whatsoever. Um, but these three organizations are kind of working together to see how could we kind of restructure things so that payday lenders were not the only option that people had when they needed a quick sort of infusion of cash or a very small loan. Um, and then another interesting one is that states actually at this point regulate payday lending, which is why in the video you saw um, the, the guy who owns the check cashing store talking about how he doesn't offer payday lending at his location because it's not allowed in New York, but that he would if he could. Um, basically payday lending itself is um, regulated at the state level. And Pew has done a lot of uh, work since 2011 studying payday lending all across the country and is sort of putting forth Ohio's recent state reforms as a good model for what other states could do. Um, 
And if you're interested in learning more exactly about what that Ohio model looks like, you can, once you have the slides, you can click the link there. Um, generally speaking, Pew is where I find the best set of resources about payday lending. As I said, they've been embarking on studying payday lending since 2011. So there's tons of good web resources on their website. Um, and also the very popular documentary that many of you have seen um, spent looking for change. Uh, it's like a 40 minute documentary that covers kind of a lot of topics. Um, if you've never watched it, I really recommend it, but they've got like a good portion on not only payday lenders, but also check cashing as well as auto title loans too. Um, and then tons of really good interactives um, that you can use in our resource collection. Um, Shady Sam, the game uh, that actually just won sort of an award uh, for its game design. Uh, is a really awesome one. And again, this sort of interactive um, right here, I think is a great one from Pew, where you can look state by state what payday lending looks like in your state. Oh man, I feel like I've uh, done a bad job of demonstrating these things to you, sorry. Flash is not going to, uh, no, we're not gonna do that right now. Anyway, <laughs> as long as you have Flash, it's a really good one. Um, I just got a new laptop and it does not have its flash set up appropriately. Sorry about that. All right, then my other really favorite topic in this unit is about playing the lottery. Um, and I'm gonna zoom up here, take a look at the polling of where you agreed. Um, if I won $5,000 playing the lottery, I would post about it on social media. A brave one of you said, yes, you agree, you would. Five said disagree, 13 said strongly disagree. Um, that one's, you know, purely opinion. It's not like something horrendously bad is going to happen if you post about it on social media, but it's another good conversation starter with your students. Um, let's see here. Um, so some interesting stuff about the lottery that I think can lead to really good conversations with your students. Um, this idea of like why we play the lottery. Um, there's a good Psychology Today article um, that basically narrows it down to these two things. One is join the party, especially when the jackpot is really, really high. There's just some social pressure. Everybody's doing it. Everybody's talking about it. There's a lot of buzz. There's some excitement. You've talked to colleagues like, oh, let's buy a bunch of tickets. We could all sort of like retire early, et cetera. So there's this sort of sense of belonging that comes with playing the lottery. And the second they sort of call a ticket of hope and this is this idea that, um, you know, especially if you are struggling currently financially with one ticket, you could just change the course of your life. And this idea that, you know, going ahead and paying the $2 um, or $5 or whatever, uh, whatever game you're trying to play, you can solve all of your mon money problems with just that one ticket sort of entices people to go ahead and give it a try. Um, Another th thought to think about in terms of the, the lottery is that um, the in a given year, uh, the lottery collected $73 billion essentially from ticket sales. And I, I can't remember if it was the Mega Millions or uh, the Powerball, but anyway, it essentially becomes 23 billion um, actually going back to the states. Because you see all the time that like, oh, playing the lottery benefits local schools or senior centers or any number of things. Um, but basically 63% of the ticket sales go to paying out the jackpots. Um, and then ads and commissions and running the whole thing and paying the people in charge uh, takes up another 5%. And then only about a third of the money ends up going to all of these causes that the advertise that they advertise that playing the lottery benefits. Um, and the other thing to keep in mind is that a study showed that the poorest one third of households buys half of the tickets that are sold in, the, in any given week. So essentially um, the, the households with the least income are buying half of the tickets. Um, which again is sort of this ticket of hope idea, like you could change the course of your life right there with one ticket. Um, but there's sort of two considerations to keep in mind and that can be interesting to bring up with your students. One is this idea of like, do the good causes 
actually get more funding. And so as we saw, only about a third of the funding ends up going to these different organizations that are advertised anyway. But <laughs> studies have also shown that in some cases, so for example, if it's supposed to go to the state level education, um, you know, for schools in your state, what they've found is that it's not as though the state keeps their normal budget for schools and then adds on this lottery money and top, on top of it. They basically rely on the, auto, the lottery money to fill some of the spending that they need to do at the state level. So it's not as though more people playing the lottery will benefit more schools. It's more just like the state will keep the funding for schools steady and instead um, fill basically with the lottery money and then divert the funds that would have had to go towards education to other things in the state. So it's not as though tons of lottery playing in your state will necessarily all go to schools. And then there's this question again about who's playing the lottery and what they're funding. Um, and so a lot of people refer to the lottery as regressive, again, because lower income households are paying a ton of the money for the tickets. And, but then the resources are getting spread universally throughout the state. Um, so in a way, it's sort of uh, spreading the money coming directly from poor households in post-tax income uh, and spreading it around so that everybody in the entire state can benefit. And that's why some people say it's kind of a regressive tax almost. Um, so interesting topics that you can bring up more so than just like, hey, let's talk about the lottery. There's some, there's some cool statistics and some cool considerations that you can um, have your students research into or discuss with them. Um, I mentioned earlier that this financial pitfalls unit is one of my absolute favorites. The reason being that um, I think it ties in so much stuff from other units. And this is a great example. Um, how high is lottery tax withholding in your state? So if you win the lottery, like where does your state rank and how much money they're going to take back from you? Um, and again, you can kind of click the link over here and dive in deeper to this map um, and kind of look more closely at what they'd be charged in your specific state or whether lottery winnings are even um, taxed in your state. Um, really great articles and videos over here that you can check out on your own. Um, I will also say the FinCap Friday that Yanelli did on this one, Who Wants to Be a Billionaire? takes this idea of like, yes, you could win the Powerball, but you could also um, most of the country's millionaires, million with an M, um, actually got there through investing, not through winning the lottery uh, clearly. And sort of takes this idea of if you, if you took the money that you were going to play the lottery with and instead investing it kind of where would you end up. And then this interactive is actually one of my all times favorites. Hopefully this one actually works for me. I'm, I'm 0 for 2. Sorry, folks. Um, this is the LA Times has a Powerball simulator, uh, which is just kind of cool because you can choose your own numbers here. And what it does is it goes back and looks um, sort of historically of whether you would have won the lottery. Um, but what we did is we designed an activity to go around it um, that sort of plants the seed of like, hey, here are the previous winning numbers. So psychologically, does that impact the numbers that your students are going to pick? Um, then they go ahead and see how much did they spend, how much did they win, and uh, did they end up winning or losing? Um, but then we intersperse on the worksheet, like, wow, look at these people. This is from the lottery's website. Like, look at these people. They're so happy. They're smiling. They've got their big check. They've won these huge jackpots. This could be you. And then entice the students to sort of play again um, and figure out how many times they've won. Then we come down here. Um, and again, this is from the website of like, even if you're not winning, lots of people are. There were 566 thousand winners on one single day and of course you sort of realize that lots of people ended up like winning a dollar thus they count as a winner um but you know they potentially have paid more than they uh won but they are indeed a winner on that day um so it's one of my favorite activities they get to watch like a video of a powerball being pulled and so there's this idea of 
all of this psychology and all of this marketing and advertising that entices people to pay the lottery, your kids get to kind of experience it, um, you know, in a simulated fashion. It's one of my personal favorite activities. Okay, we've got two more topics here before I wrap things up. Um, one is sort of this idea of I do anything legal to help my family even co-sign a loan or add them to my credit card. And I'm going to look at this. Um, oh, most of you said disagree or strongly disagree. That's so funny. Um, nobody's going to come looking for a loan from you. Um, <laughs> I think this is a cool topic to talk with kids about. Um, I, we recently were like looking at um, a recent trend is kind of this idea that uh, historically churches did premarital counseling and involved and like included a money piece to them. But as more and more young people uh, don't really affiliate themselves with the church, uh, that's happening less. And uh, so there was an interesting article of all of the different products and industries that have kind of joined forces to sort of marry, if you will, this idea of both marriage counseling or couples counseling, as well as financial counseling together, including some websites like wedding registries, also including some stuff about personal finance. It's kind of really interesting um, folks that are kind of joining teams to get couples talking about their money. Um, sort of this is a good video that describes what co-signing a loan means and sort of what are your responsibilities again tying back to this whole idea of managing your own credit checking your credit report what impacts your credit score etc um and then two sort of uh fun ones to do with students are they're very similar activities both of them are role play um this one is sort of peer pressure in college to spend money that, you know, maybe the people you're going to school with have money for like, oh, let's go for a ski weekend or so on and so forth. And there's this peer pressure and how might you say no to that in order to stay within your budget. And then um, the second is sort of a, an activity that role plays saying no to friends and family members when they ask you for a loan of some sort, not necessarily co-signing an official loan with them, but like, hey, can you loan me X number of dollars? Two really fun ones. I've done that second one with uh, students in classroom. It's really fun to have them sort of role play out how they might get themselves out of this situation. And then the last topic, which I'm not going to talk too, too much about is about bankruptcy. Um, it's so far removed from most teenagers because most teenagers haven't even had the opportunity yet to get themselves into enough financial trouble that bankruptcy would need to enter the picture. Um, but uh, it is included in the financial pitfalls unit. And I think this Investopedia article is a really great resource about top 10 financial mistakes that is sort of more applicable to students. Um, sort of this idea of like buying a brand new car um, or living paycheck to paycheck or sort of living on borrowed money or excessive spending. Those are things while bankruptcy might not be super, super applicable, these are sort of um, topics that are part of their lives or will be soon. And I thought kind of interesting, this Northwestern Mutual Report is also chock full of statistics, graphs, charts, data that you can use with your students. Um, I thought this one was really cool. It's how many paychecks can you go before missing your financial obligations? Um, and you will see that there's a big cluster here of folks who basically would make it a month or less right here. Um, and then you've got kind of scattered and then you've got uh, another big pocket of people that are like, yeah, I can make it 10 or more paychecks. And sort of what this shows to me is that there's either folks who have their nice big emergency fund nest egg of, you know, maybe six months of um, salary saved up. And then generally speaking, tons and tons of folks don't have that money saved up or <laughs> quite sad, 50% almost are not even sure how many paychecks it would last. So that's, again, sort of an indicator that folks are not spending a ton of time thinking about their finances every month. Um, here's some good uh, articles about bankruptcy. And then we've got a case study. 
as well as sort of a bankruptcy web class where kids go around and sort of define some bankruptcy terms, figure out the two different main types of bankruptcy that individuals can file, et cetera, in kind of a web quest format so that you're not just telling them about bankruptcy, they're learning it for themselves. All right, at this point, I want to head to our website and show you where you could learn more. So at ngpf.org, two key places to find stuff about financial pitfalls. One is to either scroll down on this home page and find it here, or to go to curriculum and choose units and it'll bring up a page that looks just like this. But if you click financial pitfalls, Tons of activities, projects, et cetera, even ones that I did not include on the slide, there's way more than what I included, are over here in the right-hand column. And then our full year curriculum that I've been referring to off and on is over here in the left-hand column. Semester course does not really go into most of these topics, although there is a lesson about identity theft and there's um, some lessons on behavioral finance and some of those topics overlap, but generally speaking, the full lessons for this are really only available in our full year course. The other thing I want to show you is if you haven't seen it, if you come to community and click on the blog, you can search for some of the topics um, on the blog. I would not search up here. That searches our whole website and you're going to zoom back to those activities and projects and stuff but rather search the blog and you can, you know, search for things like check cashing or payday lending or um, bankruptcy, et cetera. Or you can zoom down here to the categories and sort of pick ones that would be applicable like behavioral finance. Um, down here, you will see financial scams. You will see the FinCap Fridays of which there are quite a few on um, financial pitfalls. And there's also a section here on identity theft. So the blog is another great place to keep up to date on really recent resources around um, financial pitfalls. Anybody have questions here for me? You can go ahead and put them into the chat, if you will, and I will pull up the chat here so that I'm seeing them as they come in. So if you have any questions, go ahead and put them in there. I will answer, you will type them in, but I will answer them out loud. Um, and you can choose in the chat to either send it directly to me, um, or you can send it to everybody and let everybody see your question, whatever you would prefer. Um, but I will answer them if you've got questions while people decide if they want to ask questions. Some other next steps is I really encourage you to check out our FinCap, FinCamp, sorry, FinCamp page to see if we are coming to your area sometime soon. We've got some FinCamps happening the rest of November and the very beginning of December. And then we take a bit of a holiday break because we hope all of you are taking a holiday break as well. And then come back in January with a ton of FinCamps throughout the spring. Um, and of course, even if a FinCamp is not coming anywhere near you, virtual PD, um, VPDs are always coming near you because you do them from the comfort of your home. And so check out the virtual PDs, both FinCamps, webinars, and virtual PDs all count towards your NGPF Academy hours. Um, so I know a lot of you have received swag from achieving your freshman or sophomore or junior or even senior status. Um, so checking out either FinCamps or virtual PDs is a great way to continue to add on to your hours um, and work toward being invited to our user conference that's gonna happen this summer, um, as well as earning more swag. Um, all right, I'm gonna put my contact information up there as well. Um, I've got some questions coming in. When can we get the PowerPoint? Um, as I mentioned, just coming back from maternity leave, I'm a little rusty. If I can figure out how to send everything packaged up and out to you tonight, I'll get it out to you tonight. If I hit some roadblocks, I'm going to have to touch base with somebody who knows what they're doing better, and then it'll come out tomorrow. So either you'll get it today via email or tomorrow, just depending on how quick I pick up on this stuff. Um, somebody else is saying, is tribal lending the same as a payday loan? And I will tell you, I do not know anything about tribal lending, so I'm not even going to take a guess, but I can kind of try to look it up for you. Um, or if somebody else has an answer, go ahead and chime in of whether tribal lending is the same as a payday loan. I don't know the answer. Um, 
Thanks for folks for saying that this was a good webinar. Uh, I enjoyed this topic a ton myself. Um, it is, I would agree with Mary Smith that it's really easy to make this topic fun, relevant, interesting for students, tons of discussions that you can bring up, tons of fun interactives like Shady Sam, like that lottery one that I was um, mentioning, um, I think are all really good ways to tie these sort of financial pitfalls in for students and make it real. Ooh, somebody said if I had a limited amount of time, which pitfall do you suggest to hit? Okay, I personally think that the most interesting one for me personally is the one about predatory lending because it's so, so prevalent. If you remember that video, it said that um, there are more payday lenders than there are Starbucks and McDonald's combined. They are everywhere. I know on my commute home, I pass dozens of them driving from the train station to my kids' daycare, like dozens and dozens of them. So in many communities, these are super, super prevalent. Um, I think the one thing I would caution is that you wanna make sure that you're sort of um, culturally and communitively sensitive to the fact that some of your students, their parents might rely on payday loans and this idea that uh, they might not have other options available at this time. So you wanna make sure if you do this with your students that you're not like, always a bad idea. Anybody who does it, this is a stupid idea. You know, you want to make sure that you keep in mind that for folks without access to credit, this is a really real resource and might be a real part of their life. So personally, I think it's the most interesting topic. I think in a much more lighthearted way, I think things around the lottery are super, super fun for kids. Um, you know, some of them that aren't 18 yet are like just waiting to buy that first lottery ticket. Um, so I, if I had to choose, I'd pick one of those two because they're kind of the most fun, I think. Um, all right. Let's see. Is there a place to check how many credits we have earned? Yes, there is. I think you can still see my screen. You will go over to um, Teacher PD. You will go to like say virtual PDs or I think it works on FinCamps too. Uh, here you will see NGPF Academy and the different types of PD that we offer. And then you can click log in. And let's see, <laughs> um, if you log in here, let me see if I remember my own password for this. Yes, it worked. Once you log in, <laughs> you will see that I have zero credits right now because I have not attended any PD, um, but you will see how many total credits you have um, you will also see what else you have registered for so far and what else you have attended. Um, you'll notice here that I attended these, these are like really old webinars from years ago, so they don't count towards my 10. It has to be from June 1st, 2019. Um, but that is how you do it. Basically you go to one of our teacher PD pages, you click profile, you log in, and then you should be able to see your own credits and hopefully you are doing better than I am. If you too have zero credits, just know that once we get this all taken care of today, uh, you will have one credit for attending this webinar. So thanks for coming. Um, thanks to folks who saying it, I was not that rusty. Thank you, I was nervous. Um, <laughs> uh, cool. All right, anybody else have questions for me as we hit the hour here? I'm happy to stick around and answer questions, but I'm also happy to let you guys know go. I know how uh, demanding the life of a teacher is and you've probably got a million priorities. So thanks for spending an hour with me. Keep the questions coming if you have them and otherwise have a delightful rest of your evening. Uh, there should be a survey that pops up when you uh, log out of the webinar. Hopefully that launches. If not, I'm going to figure out what to do. Again, I'm kind of rusty on this, but it should pop out a survey so that you can get your certificate, your slides, etc. All right, I'm not seeing any more questions coming in. Again, thank you for joining me um, and have a really great evening. And you can also always ping me. Um, yes, you just closed the window to log out. Um, you can ping me at jessica at ngpf.org if you think of some questions later that you want to ask me. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a good night. <laughs>